So last, I'll give a warm, warm welcome to Mr. Bill Hunneman. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, listening to the first two panels this morning, I should have been rewriting all these slides, but bear with me. A um, couple of comments. Um, I want to go over some slides very, very quickly to kind of give you an idea of where we at the Department of Energy have been, where we think we are today, and where we may be going, where we think we're going in the future. And then I want to contribute to the conversation that the folks were having prior to the break. Many of you are aware that we, 19, uh, in 2006, sorry about that, we published the Roadmap to Secure Control Systems. That's been around, that's been the basis for quite a bit of activities in DOE, how we spend the, the monies that Congress has given us uh, to address things in control system. That has been updated. It's in the process of being finalized right now. It's supposed to go to the Sector Coordinating Council, I think, sometime this uh, in March, early March, I believe. It, it is an update, and uh, it brought, it's broadened to include a little bit more than control systems. When you read it, you'll find it's still got a strong control system focus, since the, uh, many, many folks who contributed to this still believe the control system SCADAs, those kind of, and the other things that go into the normal term of control systems are part of our, our continuing core problem we need to deal with. The, the new framework provides a number, uh, an updated vision the idea is that re re reliability continues to be an issue, but we need to add resiliency to that. We need to add resiliency to the idea that regulations need to be changed to support that. Resiliency needs to be part of the architecture, part of the implementation, part of the vendor developed solutions. We've got to be able to keep running. The grid needs to keep operating, keep providing electricity while it's under attack. Traditional ideas of cybersecurity simply don't work anymore. They don't work anymore in the general IT space, but they particularly don't work in the electric grid. The, the bullets on, on your left pretty much summarize the kinds of things you've been hearing already this morning. We need to figure out how to get a culture of security, starting from your C-level folks all the way down to the, the person who clears, cleans the, the trash cans at night. If, you, if you're really into this physical cybersecurity paranoia kind of thing, let me tell you what a guard told me at 2 o'clock in one of the DOE nuclear facilities when we were doing a major study. 2 o'clock in the morning, literally. We were talking to this young man, and he said, you need to think about the guards. The folks who walk around your facility, they've got all the keys to get in all the offices to, do, to clean the trash or, or to check everything. He said, I'm your biggest threat. We said, what are you talking about? Because we all thought we were geeks and all the other kind of stuff. He said, I'm going to school in the local community college learning about cybersecurity. I have an entire night to get to break into systems and do things. You may never know I'm there. Those invisible people are one of our big problems. Uh, the culture is definitely there. Assessing risk, uh, come back to that in a minute. Develop new measures, new processes. Many of you are actively engaged in that. All of you are in one form or another engaged in that. Managing incidents is a big problem, as you heard. Uh, the utilities are reluctant to share data. There's things going on at the national level to try to begin to ease some of that. I'm participating in an uh, administration working group to write legislation that would facilitate reporting from critical infrastructures to U.S. CERT cyber incident information making it a little bit easier by protecting that data as well as indemnifying the reporting organization from possible lawsuits coming from that. Folks are thinking about that problem and how to improve it. I can't, re can't I, I wouldn't be remiss if I didn't remind those of you who don't know about it, the National Skated Test Bed Program has been underway since 2003, is continuing. It is one of the crucial activities that the department is committed to and will continue it is a multi-laboratory solution that reviews control system components, evaluates them, and provides the reports of those evaluations back to the control system uh, suppliers. 
with the expectation or the hope that they will in fact improve their products. There have been a number of cases where systems have been, components have been evaluated by the, by the researchers and they have improved the products. One of the problems, one of the challenges for you collectively, for the cybersecurity community in the electric grid, is how do we get past this reluctance to share vulnerability information? If you're in a utility and you discover vulnerability, one of the things we, we understand is happening is non-disclosure agreements prevent you from sharing that with your, your neighbor utility. We gotta figure out a way to get past that. The IT space has figured out how to do that many, many year, after many, many years of, of practice. We need to start looking at using some of those lessons learned. One of the things that's, that's also being supported by DOE is the TCPIG. This is a consortium led out of the University of Illinois to start looking out, thinking out of the box. How do we build microgrids? How do we create the architectures? How do we build the tools to enable all of these things to happen? There's some very excellent research coming out of those folks, a number of, of uh, solutions and approaches that are they're, they've got, I believe it's like 25 or 30 companies participating with them. A lot of aggressive active work research going on there. If you want some information on it, let me know. I'm sure all of you have heard about the billions of dollars that DOE is spending on the smart grids, and there'll be more about this tomorrow. But I want, I want to give you a little bit of a background on this. $3.2 billion, uh, 100 grants. The cybersecurity portion of that uh, at the time the grant, the request for proposals was issued, the NIST IR did not exist. There was nothing that, uh, in terms of cybersecurity requirements, that was tailored to the electric sector. A team was assembled from the list of agencies you see there, DOE, NIST, FERC, DHS, CIA, to, to write some requirements, some expectations for the cybersecurity plans. Each of the uh, folks applying for one of the grants had to submit a cybersecurity plan. It was part of the evaluation. Some of them were very good, some of them were not so good. I looked at one that said, literally, we are going to buy these products, won't say what, from the vendor. The vendor will take care of all the cybersecurity that's needed. That was their plan, okay? We have a team of folks led out of our Pacific Northwest <laughs> National Laboratory who have been evaluating these plans, providing a lot of feedback to the grantees. Uh, they, they've gradually improved those plans. In some cases, they've aggressively improved the plans, and they are now aggressively implementing those plans. One of the things we did shortly after all the grants were announced, we went back and asked all of the grantees to have a senior management official sign the cybersecurity plan committing to delivering that. I understand it caused a little bit of angst, but by and large, several of, most of them did it fairly easily. Uh, there were some, some folks working through that. The grants are underway. Uh, that we're continuing to work on uh, with the utilities, with the grantees, I should say, to uh, implement and continue to improve their cybersecurity. Many of them committed in their security plans to uh, apply the NIST, or NIST IR whenever it came out. They're starting to do that. There is a lot of progress being gained. Uh, the department is now uh, actively uh, collecting common cybersecurity practices. There's a webinar, I think it was two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, uh, to share that among the grantees. The goal is to pull all this together and start sharing it for the entire community. Notice I said common practices. One of my soapbox bug type items is best practices. If you hand somebody a list of best, and tell them it's the best practices, that invites a C-level person to say, okay, that's all we gotta do. Therefore, the silver bullet, I don't have to do anymore, don't come back, just do that and be done. Common practices is by far and away a better term. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're trying to get started, we've, we've gotten it started, is just now underway, partially uh, to address the threat sharing uh, information sharing point that was made with the last panel is NESCO. Uh, there's actually two parts to this, NESCO and NESCORE. EPRI is implementing NESCORE. Um, the R stands for resource. Um, EnergySec is implementing the NESCO. Their long-term goal, my vision for this, 
is, is for this organization to eventually become the cybersecurity program office for the electric sector. Frankly, and my NIST brethren will shoot me, NIST and DOE should not be in a position of writing guidelines for the electric sector. It ought to come from an industry-led, industry-written, industry-supported, industry-guided activity. NESCO is an attempt, is the first seed to begin moving in that direction. The goal is after the, the $10 million uh, government grant, after three years, we'll become fully self-sustaining and become that office. <clears throat> Let me shift to something that's going on right now. We just started the energy sector, the electric sector risk management process initiative. This is an outgrowth of the, of the NIST IR. When we started looking at wrapping up the NIST IR, Annabelle and I, and, and following on Marianne Swanson, who couldn't make it today, started looking at what's the next step. We've laid 500 pages of, of cybersecurity information on you. What should you do? Now, you heard from the IOUs this morning. They're in great shape. The 2,000 or so odd munis, smaller utilities, and the co-ops need all the help they can get. Whatever it is, they need it. Whatever you can think of, they need it. One of the things is how do we start giving them a basis to build a good cybersecurity program? As we were having those conversations, uh, do all of you know who Mark Weatherford is? Mark Weatherford is the chief security officer for NERC. He, he, might, he replaced Mike Asante. Mark's, uh, yeah, Mark's background is the CIO in the state of California. He brought a CIO view of things uh, to, to that job. He sat down with us and said, what do we do to fix this compliance mindset that's out there? Uh, needless to say, we, a bunch of us jumped on that, and out of that grew this initiative. This initiative is, in fact, a collaboration between DOE, NIST, uh, NERC, and the Cybersecurity Working Group. Dave Dalva, who's another co-chair of the CSWG, is one of the, the leads on this collaboration. The focus of this is to develop a risk management process and guideline for all the stakeholders in the electric sector. It's got to acknowledge all the different kinds of activities, all the different kinds of emissions. What I've told the folks, and this, by the way, is a DOE-led effort. It, falls on his face, it's a DOE, it's not a NIST. NIST is a partner with us. NERC is a partner with us. The idea is to write a risk management process, not risk assessment. There will be no how-to in there. This is a process. My goal is to write the process down so that the service providers, the generators, the transmission, whoever you can think of as a stakeholder can, in fact, apply it and they will then get a consistent view of what risk management can be in the electric sector. Mark has said that one of his goals, if we're successful with this, is to begin transitioning the, the current NERC SIPs to some kind of a much lower, much smaller set of man mandatory compliance type requirements and then focus what, we're, what we really need to do on risk management. The kind of conversation we've been having is at that point, the folks would come in and audit or, re or review your program, would look to see how you're executing your risk management, not what you're complying with. The risk management problem comes about, for, for example, what kind of risk do you assign to the meter on your side of your house? It's gonna be a different risk than you might assign to the meters, whatever they are at, the, at a hospital, for example. The utilities need the flexibility to apply a risk management approach to decide the right level of security so you can do a cost-effective implementation of cybersecurity. It will be a guideline. It will be published by DOE. Hopefully, as I mentioned, I talked to the NARU folks a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully, this will also lead to a common perspective of what they will be asking you your, uh, as your regulators. These, these are the goals. Uh, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. I want to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, with all due respect to Eric, I don't like the carpenter model. 
Uh, the one that, that's almost identical to that that I, I ran across at a brainstorming session a while back at Sandia that came out of it was the cybersecurity community and the electric sector is, is not immune to this, is more akin to where we were with the medical profession in the late 1880s. There are lots and lots of practitioners. You got sick, you called the local doctor. The local doctor was an excellent diagnostician. Many of them, as I understand it, could, could smell the disease and, and reach a, con a conclusion, diagnosis. They executed the medical procedures to isolate you, quarantine you, treat you, whatever kind of thing. Eventually, we've grown into the doctor networks and things like that we have today, up to and including the CDC. In, in the carpenter sense, the carpenters that Eric was talking about, the deck builders, were the local doctors in the 1880s. It's taken a long time to get the medical profession up where we have the highly integrated, knowledgeable information exchange process that's going on. It's, it's the same analogy, it's just I, I like the doctors in the 1880s kind of a thing. One of the problems we've got to figure out how to deal with, and I, I want to leave you at the end of this with the ideas you've got to help us collectively figure out how to solve these problems. Many of you think we're working on them. Bits and pieces are being worked, don't get me wrong. I would submit we do not have a sector-wide understanding of what these issues are and why we might go forward, how to even begin to approach them. It's obviously more complex, it's getting worse and worse. We need to figure out how to deal with the resiliency issues and those kinds of things. A lot of this is preaching to the choir and I realize that. One of the ones that, that I dearly love is we've got to get to wide area situational awareness for cyber. If we're going to properly protect the grid and be able to respond in a timely way to cyber intrusions, whether it's Elbonia, China, or, your, or the kid down the street, we've got to have a nationwide perspective of what's going on. That means intrusion detection and management systems have to exist at the local level, perhaps at the state level, perhaps at the regional level, and definitely at the national level. It may be that some nation state is attacking a utility on the west coast, doing a similar kind of attack on the west coast, and doing something in, against ERCOT in Texas. And if you keep these stovepipes in place, we'll never know that a common attack is underway. The kind of world that I live in, I, I spend quite a bit of time on the dark side, and you can see these kind of widespread, low and slow, those kind of terminology type attacks. The grid today has no ability to, to recognize that's going on. We can leverage a lot of stuff that's going on, but we need to build, we've got to get to continuous monitoring back to the metrics and those kinds of issues. If we get good continuous monitoring with good risk management, the metrics question is no longer a big issue anymore because everybody can understand the, the cybersecurity posture. We've got to get to a near real time. The idea of uh, detecting something, calling your CEO or your chief security officer and say, Joe or Mary, you need to go block port 440. By the time it gets down to that system administrator, that firewall manager, whoever's going to execute that, the attack is already over. We've got to get near real-time <coughs> continuous distribution of this stuff in the appropriately secured way. Information sharing, timely and actionable. I can't count the number of times that I've heard, and I suspect it's true for all of you. We know the intelligence community knows all this information. If they just share it with us, we would be in a lot better shape. I live on that side quite a bit of time, like I said. You'd be surprised. The question is, what is really needed in an actionable way? Do you need to know that port 440 needs to be blocked? And a little bit of that background, yeah. One of the challenges is to figure out how to get that information out of the intelligence community at a level that we can share with you. It doesn't do any good to give your CEO a clearance to hear it, or your chief security officer a clearance. They, when they can't turn around and tell the folks who have to implement it what to do. <coughs> We've got to get the information declassified or its sensitivity lowered to the point that we can send it directly to the people who can go action on it. If you don't, it's too late. 
you've heard that we talk, we talk a little bit about regulatory models. We definitely need to do something about that. We have got to get out of the compliance is the be all end all solution. Risk management is hopefully going to move us down that path. Uh, I think it was Jamie mentioned something about safe harbor. Think about the future. Government discovers through its means that a cyber attack is about to be launched against the grid. And the government through its processes, whatever they may exist at the time, tells everybody, go offline for five minutes. Can you imagine the number of lawsuits, complaints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to come about with that kind of an action? Right now, there's no protection from, from, for anybody who's a stakeholder electric grid of that kind of action being taken. Some of the legislation that we talked about last year and is going to come back is giving the president or the secretary of energy, and take your favorite pick, maybe for the ability to declare a cyber emergency in the grid and direct specific actions. We've got to in include with that the safe harbor provisions. Not your problem, but if you have opportunity to talk to your congressional uh, representatives and the like, um, it's a point that needs to be made. Cybersecurity cost is going to be another longstanding problem. The business models for many of the utilities simply don't allow frequent uh, cost recovery to continually upgrade your cybersecurity. The idea of cybersecurity lasting for 40 years is not, it just doesn't valid anymore. I will challenge you if you're on the IT side of the space, whether you're an implementer or a vendor, go back and think about what you've been doing. Is your model of cybersecurity implicitly or explicitly assuming that you're going to be able to have that two to three year technology refresh? We all think about our desktops are valid in with our iPhones, you take your pick. After a couple of years, we've got to replace them. Rethink that. And supply chain. We all know about that problem. How do we solve that problem collectively when the stuff may need to last for 40 years? A little bit of closing. For those of you who've been around a long time, are we repeating the internet experience? How many of you who were around a long time remember the old, what we now call ISPs? They're not around anymore. Everything has evolved. Part of the problem is we had all kinds of laws, regulations, <laughs> policies, and technologies. We had inconsistent standards, expectations at all levels of all of this thing. Everybody was thinking all kinds of different ways of doing it. It's taken a long time. Several folks I've talked to characterize the current electric grid as being about where the inter internet experience was some 12 to 14 years ago. I would submit that if that is truly the case as a nation, and you as an individual contributing to that nation should not be willing to tolerate that, there's been enough lessons learned, not technologies, but lessons learned on how to do a much better job of securing the grid. And as I said this morning, we need to figure out what the definition of the grid is. The authorities and responsibilities need to be clarified, for, particularly for the smart grid as we modernize the current grid towards something that's called smart grid. Um, basically, nobody's in charge right now. And I'm not, I don't mean charge in the sense of specifying what needs to be done, but providing the leadership and coordination to making sure all these hundreds of conferences and, and working groups and things like that are, are successful. And with that, I'll stop. Those who don't know me, I'm a, I'm a railroad buff. This is a narrow gauge railroad, top of a mountain, trying to figure out how to turn two engines around and set them back down the mountain. And I think quite often, most of us are the middle guy in, in, in the picture. <laughs> Thank you.